Good to see everybody. We are in a study on identity, sort of looking at, sort of examining how, there we go, how our culture teaches us who we are. And what we say is this, every culture, every people have an identity formation process. We don't always see it. We don't see that we're in the middle of it. But it's a way of shaping us as human beings and sort of telling us who we are, how we fit in in the world. And the goal is helping to answer some of the big questions that we have in life, like why am I here and what is my life to be like? And so what we've been looking at is, well, how does Christianity, how does the gospel, how does Jesus impact this sense and create this sense of of who we are as we follow him? How does he give us connection to our, our true identity? I'm going to read um, from the book of Romans. You'll have a, you have an insert in your program that has the text, um, and then we'll jump back in. I, hopefully, I can make sense of it because uh, it's super important principles for us to be able to apply as we're learning this. So if you'll turn, you either watch on the wall or it's in, it's in your program this morning. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Let's let's pray together. Let's pray. Father, it's like the water we swim in every day. We hardly recognize. It's the air we breathe. We hardly recognize that we're breathing it, but we are. It sustains us. And Lord, we know that it's also true of our stories, the, really the life we are living, that we rarely see how our stories impact us, the story that we're living in. And so I pray that as we come together today, as, as we're learning about our identity in Jesus, that you will show us the story that you've placed us in. And Father, we thank you that in, the, in this culture in which we're living, where it seems like the wind is blowing one way today and tomorrow this, a, a different direction, or maybe even this afternoon in a different way, and we can forget who we are, that you speak a true word to us. And I pray, Lord, that you'll give us the ability today to live in, this, in the story that you have written. And we thank you and we pray together in Jesus' name, amen. Who's in control of your story? Who's in control of your image? Every year this time of year is the NFL season is going. I don't know if you're an NFL fan, you may know about this. There is a huge battle. And by the way, it's not over contracts. It's not over playtime. It actually is over the most significant video game about football, right? It's called Madden. Have you heard of Madden? Maybe you've played it. I've watched kids play it. I've tried to play it myself, okay, but not too well. And if something happens this time every year, the stats come out that determine how fast those players in the video game are going to run, whether they're going to catch the pass and be able to make the touchdown. It actually controls how they appear, their ability to, and the distance and the accuracy that they can throw a football. Those are all updated in the game every year. And by the way, this is going to determine how you appear and how successful 
you're going to be. Now, let me tell you what it's like. This guy, his name is Dustin Smith. Here he is pictured with Minnesota Vikings player Stefan Diggs. Dustin is on the left. He is the Lord of Madden. He gets to choose every year how the players are going to look, how their stats are going to be updated, and guess what happens when the, when the new year comes out? His phone just starts blowing up. I mean, because the players get his number, and they just start calling him. Here's Baltimore Ravens' Tony Jefferson. Hey, man, why do you make me so slow? He says, like, you made me slow in the game. I am not slow like that. Or listen to Tyrone Crawford of Dallas. Who on your staff felt it okay to make my body look like Humpty Dumpty? They can make, he can make them look however he wants. I really loved this one from Christian Covington of the Texans. Guess I have to accept the fact that I'm ugly now. Say it ain't so, Madden. Shaking my head, he says. <laughs> and you're like, come on. But I mean, we guard this stuff, Right? I mean, we want to be fast. We want to look good. We want to be in control of our image. And what we're learning is it's our nature to create like a persona that we project out to people, the person we want them to see, the, the individual that we want them to know. And we spend much of our lives crafting and sustaining this image of ourselves. And we've been learning about this in this identity series. And last week we learned that once we come to faith in Christ, we become identified by Jesus. So what would happen if we began to live out of that? In other words, if Jesus became the Lord and, and the one who over our identity, because He is the one who created us in His image. He is the one who knows us the best. He is the one who really is Lord over all made in God's image, children of God. Now, here's the problem. Though that is true, if you've come to faith in Christ, you don't believe that. And actually, you have a story to prove it. Now, you say, well, what do I mean? Well, as we experience life every day, our minds have a compulsive need to make sense of all of the things that are happening to us. Our brains look for patterns in behavior and then construct explanations, like we can't keep ourselves from doing this, stories to explain things. We use these stories to explain, for example, why bad things happen to us, why tr people treat us the way they do, why we seem to get so many bad breaks in life. And by the way, after a little while, that story, whether it's true, and by the way, it never is completely true. It drives our lives. We live out of that story. And before long, that story begins to control your actions. Now, I am constantly, personally, I am constantly surprised at how often I am operating out of the story of my past and how powerful and controlling that is, you, you ever in the middle of a situation and you realize how much you're operating out of this story, how powerful it is, and then how difficult it is to change that narrative that drives our lives. You see, what we do is we convince ourselves, well, I'm not good at relationships because something happened in my past. I, I should avoid getting close to people. Or we fail to take risks, so we refuse to venture into something bold. And you get the idea. Now, many of our self-stories tell us that we are not or will not be loved or that we're just not enough. We're not smart enough or we're not strong enough, we're not beautiful enough, or these things just wouldn't be happening to me in my life. And actually, you may discover this narrative because you will run to it when you're feeling pain or, or when something negative is happening or when you're under stress because you've used that to explain why this is happening in your life. And so that's the question. What, what narrative do you run to when you feel hurt or you've been rejected? What, what explanation do you give yourself when you, when you fail, when you become sick, when you're afraid? Now, I think of a friend, Nick, that I met in New Jersey, who's, when he was a, a tiny little boy, his mom died, 
And his dad, he was the only child of his parents. His dad had no idea what to do with a kid. So you know what he did? He, he drove him into the city of Philadelphia. They lived in rural Pennsylvania and dropped him off at this orphanage that's there and left him there. And he only came back like two times over all the years that Nick was growing up. And out of that, Nick created this narrative because the person who was most supposed to love him in the world wasn't interested in him, didn't seem to care about him, and never showed up. And this factored in to the way that he viewed everybody else and his relationship with them. And when I met Nick, he was married, but he couldn't really get close to his wife. And he certainly couldn't believe that other men in his life might respect him or actually be his friend. And though he had left the orphanage more than a decade before I, after I met him, I'm sorry, before I met him, he was still living like an orphan. That story was driving his life. And the reality is, all of us have created stories. All of us have made explanations. Our, our mind just says, does that. It, it creates a narrative because things have to be understood and explained. Now, something happened. Nick's wife came to our church. She came to faith in Christ. And then Nick came to our church. And the question was, well, how is his life, how is this story ever going to be changed? How is he going to be able to live differently? And the, what began to happen was this, you know, how is Jesus going to give Nick a new identity? And it's the same way that he gives it to us. He enters in to our story. He joins us in our story and gives us a new one, our, our true and new identity. Because he knows this, to change our lives, he can't just tell us things. He has to change the, the way we see and live the story that we're in. And that's what this passage and this text is about today. And why I think it is so fundamental, if you're a follower of Jesus, is living out, uh, living out of that new identity. So that's what I want to look at with you, how we live our new story in Christ. Now, this book, the book of Romans, was written by the Apostle Paul. And man, this was a guy with a story. He was an overachiever in Judaism. He wanted to get everything right to prove to God and to everybody else that he mattered. He was a good man. He, would, he, he could do it. But this is where it led him. He said, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. You see, he wasn't just a, a faithful Jew. He seethed with anger when people disagreed with him because his identity was so rooted in his own performance. He kept the law. He went to the best schools. He was the good guy who was so good, he became bad to protect it. And this led him into violence, actually to participating in a murder. How are you going to change that story? How are you going to take what could be in your past and seems indelible, how are you going to change that? He says, the grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. He says, look, if you want to know somebody who needs a lot of grace, I am that guy. To change this story is not an easy thing. But how do you do it? How could Christ change the story of this man. How can anyone change their story? Doesn't my story become who I am? In a sense, isn't my past indelible? Well, this is how he explains it happening. He says, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So in explaining this, Paul uses the language of baptism. And we think of baptism, we think of dunking a person under water. But this word was used before that for what was happened when you would take cloth and you would dip it into a dye, and by doing that, it would change its characteristics. It would change, it would, it would re-identify it as something else. 
And so what he's talking about here isn't the water baptism that we have, but a baptism we have in Jesus. Paul says, my story changed because I had become identified fully with Christ. In a sense, I've been dipped into Christ, clothed with Him. But notice the, the nature of this identification. He says, we were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death. He says, let me tell you, the only way that my story in life could be changed is if I pass through a sort of death, you say, what does he mean about, by that? What does that mean? Well, our past is redeemed by being nailed to the cross of Jesus. So this isn't a, hey, you can get your life together if you try harder, or you can live as a Christian if you just work at it message. You can fix things and turn them around. This is a, you need to die. You need to die. And Jesus will give you, indeed, he has given you a new life. I've been impacted by uh, the story of this guy. His name is Chad Bird. It's sort of a dark picture, hard to see him there, but it fits. This guy was like Paul. I mean, he excelled in school, super successful. He was one of those guys that when he went to graduate school, the professors look at him and they're like, he's the rising star. This guy's going to become a professor. And after he finished, it was a seminary, he had his graduate degrees, he was hired, he was on this trajectory of success, married with beautiful children, the perfect story. But it became about him. Because you see, deep down in his personal story were all of these insecurities just looking to be fed. It was never enough. And this led him to, it opened a door to an affair, actually to a number of affairs, and the truth came out, and, and he lost his marriage. He lost the respect of his children. He lost his career and his reputation and really his life. He became a truck driver driving the graveyard, this graveyard shift. This, this is his truck. The reality was he, he lost everything. And that was like an apt metaphor about how dark his life had become. How do you come back from that? What, what way do you turn that around? This is what he said. He said, our Father rewrites our life stories with the ink of the cross. He takes our botched narratives full of self and fills them with Jesus. My son, he says, is now who you are. He is your story, your identity. You're everything. How did this happen to Chad? It, it was a death. This is why he speaks of the ink of the cross, of, of passing through the death of Jesus, all of the sin, all of the brokenness of his story, even his own self-image dying. Then it's gone. He's not talking about a physical death. He's talking about being bonded with Jesus and the death of his self. And Jesus then alone is left. Then he becomes your identity. And like Jesus, you become a beloved child of God. Here's Chad. You might say that we've experienced the only good kind of identity theft. <laughs> Jesus has stolen away our old identity and given us a new one. Don't you love that? It's like, let me take all that sin. Let me have that old identity. And he became who we were and we become who he is. Isn't that something? He became who we were, and we become who he is. And it's then that we learn that we are not determined by the worst thing that we've done in our lives, that our identity isn't rooted in our failures. You're not the sum of your experiences. You are not controlled by things that have been done to you in your life. And it was never about you being enough. The good news is that Jesus is enough. And Jesus says, look, you're not who you think you are. Likely you don't even know who you are, but I do. You're beloved of me. You're mine. But here's the hard part. The hard part being is that being baptized into Jesus' death means giving up on my own self-salvation. Now, this is the hard part for us to get our minds around, for our hearts to grasp. And here's why. We have been working hard our whole lives to keep ourselves alive, to keep my identity looking good, 
to keep my persona out there so that people will respect me or love me or whatever you're after. You see, to fix our own stories, and, and we actually believe on our own, I can write a better story. I can do better. And so none of us want to admit defeat, to admit I can't do it. We don't want to die. We want to keep the project going, and we're confident in the future of that project. I can do better. We believe we are capable of redeeming our own lives, and, and, and we believe that no matter how bad things become, but that is not the truth. The truth is that we don't need a little adjustment here or there. You don't need Jesus just to patch up things and make it work in your life. You need a completely new life. I do too. And for that to happen, the old one has to die. It has to be nailed to the cross of Jesus, to be buried with him. Here's the truth. You see, the real victory is found in a place that looks like defeat. It's a messy place. It's full of pain and loss and lots of blood. And this is the place we want to avoid at all costs. We don't want to get to the place where we know that we can't do it without God. We want to do it ourselves. But death is the only way to a completely new life. And this means that, that we stop promising God we will do better. We realize we won't and we can't, at least not on our own. That through Jesus, we too may live a new life. Yeah, that's where this is going. It's going to a new life that he gives us. But it passes through the death to ourself and our own self-effort. You see, with our past, our sin buried, then a new life rushes in. Listen to him explain this. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united in him, him, with him in a resurrection like his. Isn't that beautiful? It's the picture of resurrection, taking what was dead. By the way, God doesn't, he works with nothing. He works with death and brings life. He works with nothing and creates the universe. Paul isn't talking about your body being raised up after you die. He is talking about your story right now, a new story and a new identity. Listen to him again. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you hear him say that? He says, my whole life has all, my old life has all been crucified. The life that I live now is all in him. It's resting in him. His point is, I am bonded to Christ in his death, and because of that, he will raise me up. He has raised me up. My self-made story dies with Jesus, and I have a new life. And he is pushing into the future. Our future is a new life secured as we are raised up with Christ. That's the other part of our story, how we look at things going forward. Now, I think it's not, our story isn't just about looking back to the past and explaining what's happened and creating a narrative that we live out of, but then what we do is we superimpose that on the future. We begin to interpret life and look forward or look for our lives to unfold based on our story. As a pastor, I can't tell you how many times I've heard this conversation. Somebody will come to me and they'll say, that's it, I blew up my life, I will always be stuck, or some form of that. You see, when we write our stories, they always have future implications. You see, we, we superimpose them on our future and we anticipate that. So I, I had a failed relationship. I'll probably never have one, or it'll blow up. Or I crashed into my career. I will never have the chance to succeed like that again. You see, these beliefs keep us from living. And we anticipate that future even before it comes. In a sense, we are putting our future in the hands of our past. And we think it will always be this way. And that I will always be this way. But remember, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. That person, that story is gone. 
So Jesus doesn't simply put our sin and our past to death on the cross. He says, oh, I have a whole new life for you. It's lived out of a whole new story. Here's Paul again. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Do you see the language he uses there? He uses the language of slavery because in his day, slaves didn't really have control of their life. It's as if they were owned by the thing, the person that enslaved them. And what he's saying is that's what happens to us, that our story begins to own us, and it it enslaves us, and and we live out of that story. You don't know how many times with my wife, you live long enough with somebody, you begin to learn the story they're telling themselves. And she will help me see when I've ran, run in the direction of that narrative that I made up about my life, and it would dictate my behaviors, my actions and reactions going forward. And that's also true of you. So what Jesus says is, look, I want you to die with me in that whole life. I've settled that. You don't have to. I have on the cross. But then your new life needs to be lived with me in the light of what I've done for you. You live out of this new narrative as you walk with me. You're no longer owned by your old story, believing that's who you are and what your life will be. When you come to trust in Jesus, when you die with him, the slavery is broken and you are set free. And our sin doesn't define us. It doesn't tell you what your future is. God holds your future. So I ask, when, when will you stop living out of your past? When will you stop allowing it to enslave and rule your life? A few years ago, Sandy and I had the chance, I love this story, Sandy and I had the chance to visit a church in New Jersey that we had a part in planting. It's called Grace. And we were there for an anniversary service, and we met some cool friends from years ago back there. We had a great time being with them. And one of the women we, we became reacquainted with, I'd met years before, I will call her Iris. Iris was living in a horrible story, deeply addicted to drugs when she encountered one of the women in our church. First, the woman, that woman in our church invited her to a Bible study. And, and along the way, by the way, Iris was really totally trapped in this. It was, it was her past and it was her future. There was no way out of this. But a part of this was she learned that she was loved by Jesus, that Jesus died for her, and was giving her, had given her a new story. And even though she had had this deep and prolonged drug addiction, geez, something radical happened in her. She rented a house in a town, to the one town over from where the church was, And after she came to faith in Christ, and by the way, a number of drug dealers, they knew where she lived, and they would often come by to keep her supplied. And one of those dealers came by her house one day asking for her, and when she came to the door, she said to him, Iris doesn't live here anymore. Because in her mind, in Christ, she wasn't the same person she had been. She was now in a new story. And the dealer said to her, what happened to Iris? And she responded, she died. You never need to come back here again. Now for the first time, Iris, clothed to Christ, was like, I don't have to keep living the way I've been living. Christ not only settled my past, but he is giving me a new future My sins have been nailed to the cross. And she realized, I don't have to keep living this way. This doesn't have to be my story going forward. She didn't have to be a slave to her addiction because, as Paul says, anyone who has died has been set free from sin. She could live a new life. But here's the hard part. The hard part, she had to trust that in Christ she could have a new life, trusting that you do not have to live the same way going forward. By the way, for Iris, breaking the drug addiction was a lot harder than just sending one dealer away. She'd been living with this addiction for a very long time. And by the way, the drug dealers didn't stop coming to her house. 
You see, we can continue to repeat the same sins and live the same story, or we can see that we died with Christ, and now we have a new identity as found in Christ. This is hard because we've lived in this story so long, it's hard for us to believe it could ever change. As difficult as it is, as beautiful as it may be, it is for freedom Yet Christ has set us free, Paul said. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. He says, you are free. Learn how to stand in that. Live in that. Live out of your new story. Cling to your place with Jesus. He says, now if we died with Christ, we believe we also will live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again Death no longer has mastery over him, and the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you say, okay, I get all of this stuff. You're explaining it to me, but how do I live in to my new story? And let me tell you, this little bit here may be the most important part if you're a Christ follower of learning how of just every day living out of your new story in Christ may be the most important part. There are three words that sort of dot this chapter. We don't have the time to peel it all apart, but they explain how this works in our lives every day. The first word is the word to know, to know. In other words, we know that Jesus did actually die on a day in history, and when he did that, our sin was placed upon him. It is, it is not ours anymore, okay? And we live in that every day. This is what has happened. I have the knowledge and awareness of this. And so we remember this. By the way, when we're struggling with sin and with our story, we know this is true about us. The second word is the word count. In the old translations, they use the word reckon. You know what the word reckon means? It's like, just consider this is true about you. This so every day, I not only know this intellectually, but I am counting myself dead to that story. That is not my story, okay? When I'm tempted to be drawn into that, I'm just like every day, I'm just considering this is done. That is not who I am. That is not my future. I count myself. I reckon myself dead to this. This is my new story in Christ. And then the last word is the word present, present. So we don't look back and say, I'm going to fix all this stuff in my life for God because I couldn't save myself before. Instead, in a positive way, every day I'm just presenting myself to God. I'm yours. I'm going to live out of my new story. I'm going to trust in you. And by the way, there are going to be days when you struggle. There will be days when you fall. But let me tell you, it's not about that. It's about living in your new story every single day. You are in Christ. It is not the point. The point is you belong to him, and that is not who you are. So think about that. It's no, it's count, and it's every day present. I recently read Jackie Hill Perry's wonderful book. Here's a picture of Jackie. She's really terrific. She was deeply entrenched in drugs and sexual sin, and, and it all makes sense when you hear her story. She was born, her mom was working at a restaurant, slept with a guy who bust tables. They never married. She never really had a dad. He showed up a few times, and one of those times let her know that to love somebody you really didn't, it wasn't really necessary to be around. It was his way of saying, you're not going to see much of me, and I really don't care a whole lot about you. And she left that whole situation wondering first if she could ever be loved and really having no place for men, not trusting them. Because along the way, when she was a young child, her mom would drop her off at a friend's house to be watched after school so that she could go to work. Her mom didn't know she was being molested there. It was a horrible thing. It was in a basement of the house and, and terrible, I mean, imprinting of this on her life. How was she going to get out of this? How is her story going to be able to change? God found her and loved her and, like Paul, just poured a lot of grace into her life. She said, God takes back the body that he created for himself. He sets it free from the pathetic master that once held it captive and releases it into the marvelous light of its Savior. Isn't that beautiful? 
He takes it away. It's a pathetic, you know, your story is a pathetic master. Our sins are pathetic master. They just want to push us down. She said it is then not only able to want God, but it is actually able to obey God. And isn't that what freedom is supposed to be? The ability to not do as I please, but the power to do what is pleasing. By the way, that may sound easy, but it's not easy for anybody's stories to be changed. Every day it's counting yourself dead to sin, alive in Christ, and resting in your new story, just presenting yourself to God to serve Him. Jackie found herself struggling to live out of her new self, her identity given to her by Jesus. She said, someone must know that how they identify themselves will shape how they navigate life. Let me read that again. Someone must know that how they identify themselves will shape how they navigate life. In my own journey with God, I have seen the impact identity can have on my faith. When I begin to forget I am loved, that I am forgiven, that I am new, then I stop operating out of faith and instead start to behave as if my thoughts are more inerrant than Scripture. The identity I ascribe to God and the identity He gives me will always reveal the true nature of my faith. Isn't that beautiful? The identity I ascribe to God and the identity He gives me will always reveal the true nature of my faith. That's it. It's in Him, my place with Him. Our new life comes from Him, my new story united with Christ. And so as I read that, I think perhaps you're still making promises to God and and you still have this self-project going, right? You think it can be done. You know what? Beat yourself up. (laughs) Keep at it. But a day comes when you're just like, this is not working, (laughs) I need to be totally honest. I need God in my life. And if he doesn't save me, this isn't going to happen. But the good news is he already has. And then he said, I also want you to live out of my story of you going forward. You're redeemed by me. You're loved by me. Live as my child. Maybe you're still making promises. You think you can tidy up your life. Or maybe you feel trapped in an old story, struggling with the same sin. There are days when my narrative rises to the surface and and wants to push me to to behave in the way that I always have. And it's then when it's like, i got to count myself dead to that. And at that moment, just I'm presenting myself to you, God. I belong to you. You're my God. Struggling with the same sin, letting it master you. Jesus just wants you to look to him. You're fighting a battle you can't win, but one that he already has. Have you gotten honest enough in your life that you can see how much your self-story has been driving? How much you've really trusted that it's the truth? The thing is, you don't know the truth. God knows you. He knows you completely. And in Christ, he puts you in a completely different story. Father, thank you for your word. There's been so many times, Father, in which I've been so stuck with explanations I crafted from early in my life. It's impacted my relationships with so many people and the decisions that I've made. And I thank you, Father, that your purpose in Christ is not just to bring about the forgiveness of my sin the covering of that sin with the blood of Jesus, but in in showing me who I am in you and connecting me to the story that belongs to Jesus, that comes from him. And Father, I pray for all of us. I pray first, Lord, you'd help us to see how we're living in our story. But Lord, even more than that, you would show us Jesus so that we would realize that our own self-salvation, self-fixing projects are never going to do it, but it's been done by Him. Thank you for loving us, Lord. Enable us to worship and enjoy you, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.